It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Uh, before I give it, though, I, I do want to acknowledge as well, on behalf of Ontario's New Democrats, the tragedy that befell uh, Ottawa on the weekend and uh, say to the members affected uh, that uh, our hearts are with you. And I know it's been a difficult uh, road for your constituents in the last uh, couple of days. Did the Premier believe that the previous Liberal government was accurately reporting the province's deficit figure when the election campaign began this spring? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell the opposition what I, what I believed. What I believed is what the Auditor General was saying, that they were cooking the books. Here, here. That's what I believed. And I also believe that the Leader of the Opposition and the NDP party was supporting, supporting the Liberals every step of the way. Yeah. I'm going to ask the Premier to withdraw the unparliamentary right. call. Withdraw. What I do believe is we have the worst political scandal in Ontario's history at hand right now. We will be going through line item by line item. We'll be putting a team together to make sure that people are held accountable for the taxpayers of Ontario. That's what I believe. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, on Friday, the Minister of Finance put on a show that Ontarians see every time a new government rolls in, pretending to be shocked by the deficit numbers that weren't, shocked, weren't a shock to anyone who's read a newspaper over the last year. The Premier promised people a change, but this pantomime act is right out of the McGuinty win playbook. Does the Premier really expect anyone to believe it? Speaker? Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned earlier, we have the worst political scandal in Ontario's history. We have a $15 billion scandal on our hands, and we're going to get down to the bottom of it. As the NDP stood side by side, shoulder by shoulder, with the Liberals, boosting them up, as you can hear, protecting them, that is unacceptable to the people of Ontario. The people of Ontario want answers. We, we had an event, Ford Fest, on the weekend, and what I heard over and over and over again, where did my money go? Who's being held accountable? I assured the people of Ontario there's going to be answers. Yep. We will get down to the bottom of it, and there will be people held accountable. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, I wish the Premier would actually uh, look at the numbers because he would discover that the Tories propped up the Liberals about 50 per cent of the time, Speaker. That's right. The Premier spent, uh, right. the, Premier spent uh, the last spring campaign promising everything to everyone. He said that he'd balance the budget within three years, slash taxes for his wealthy friends, and do it all without cutting the services that families rely on. New Democrats have argued for months that the promise to balance the books by 2021 was reckless, irresponsible, and could not be achieved without deep, deep cuts to the services that families rely upon. Is the Premier still promising to balance the books by 2021, or is he now admitting that his promise was irresponsible and that he never had a plan to keep it? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to know why the Leader of the Opposition is defending the Wynn Liberals. That's what I'd like to know. Yep. Talk about accounting practices. The, the NDP, through you, Mr. Speaker, has the same accounting practices during the election as he saw with the Liberals for the last 15 years. They, they couldn't add up their own budget. They were $5 billion off. The only difference is the Liberals were about $9 billion off on their projections. But I can assure the people of Ontario we're going to keep with our mandate of lowering taxes to the middle-income families of this province, lowering gas prices, and we're already halfway there by a reduction of five cents per litre. We're going to lower the hydro rates to a tune of 12 per cent, and we're going to get jobs created in this great province. Restart the clock. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Let's be specific. During the last campaign, the Premier echoed our commitment to end hallway medicine in our hospitals. Yet he also committed to $6 billion across the board cuts, which would result in hospital closures in Ontario and layoffs for frontline staff. I was at the Thunder Bay Regional Hospital on Friday, a hospital like many others across Ontario that has been operating at surge capacity for months and months. Is the Premier prepared to back away from his $6 billion in cuts to ensure that hospitals like this have the resources that they need to combat hallway medicine? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can tell the Leader of the Opposition we have the best Minister of Health I've ever seen. Ever. I have all the confidence in the Minister of Health to end hallway medicine, hallway health care, stop the lineups that are four or five hours in the hallway of every hospital in this province. We will reach out to the doctors and the nurses that we think the world of, the frontline workers, to get their opinion. Once we get the input from the frontline health care workers and the nurses and the doctors, we will move forward with a joint plan because nothing is worse than a bunch of politicians telling professional Fonts. healthcare workers how to operate, operate the hospitals, what they do every single day. We will straighten out the healthcare mess that was created. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, during the campaign, the Premier promised that he could and would make $6 billion worth of cuts and that no hospital or no family would be affected by his cuts. But on Friday, his finance minister said, and I quote, the hole is deep and it will require everyone to make sacrifices without exception. Which is it? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker and Leader of the Opposition. We're focused on the $15 billion scandal at hand here that the Leader of the Opposition said, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. You knew about it. The only person that knew about it was the Leader of the Opposition and the NDP and the Liberals because they were shoulder to shoulder, standing together while they were creating the biggest political scandal in Ontario's history. We together. need answers. The people of Ontario need answers. And I can tell you the Leader of the Opposition better come up with better answers than we all knew about it. That is disgusting. Final supplementary. Well, I don't know where the Premier was hiding, but it was pretty obvious that there was going to be a problem with the auditor's uh, response to the Liberal books, and we all knew it, Speaker. So maybe the Premier didn't. He would be one of the only people in Ontario that didn't. But families in Ontario told us, on the government benches. Families Order. in Ontario told us what they want is action on crumbling schools, crowded hospitals, and disappearing jobs. Instead, they get a Premier playing games with the deficit, focused on avenging old grudges and backroom deals for his friends and scrambling to explain why he's not going to keep the empty promises that he made on the campaign trail. Everyone in Ontario knew the Liberals were playing games with the deficit. It was obvious. Will the Premier admit that his promise to instantly eliminate the deficit while offering tax handouts to his wealthy friends was irresponsible and reckless, and if not, will he tell families exactly what it is that he plans to cut? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to know where was the leader of the opposition? We never heard anything from the leader of the opposition. But the leader of the opposition knew about it, that there was no big surprise. So as the leader of the opposition, the NDP, were voting with the Liberals 97% of the time, condoning, condoning the backroom deals, condoning the wasteful spending. They were standing shoulder to shoulder with them in the biggest political scam I've ever seen in my life, wasting billions and billions of taxpayers' money that our generation and the next generation will be paying off. Each our children will be paying it off, our grandchildren will be paying it off, all because the NDP stood by and condoned the actions of the Liberals. Yep. Here, here. Stop the 
Next question, Leader of the Opposition, start the clock. The question is uh, for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. On Friday, as we've all acknowledged in the House this morning, the Ottawa region was struck by two tornadoes of devastating force. Miraculously, no fatalities occurred, as uh, the Minister for Children and uh, Youth uh, has mentioned, but several were injured, homes were destroyed, and hundreds of thousands lost power. On behalf of myself and the members for Ottawa, uh, on behalf of myself and the me members of my caucus, um, I want to say to the uh, member for Ottawa that um, there was a, a great deal of devastation. We want to acknowledge that and acknowledge the hard work and leadership, Speaker, of all of the uh, the first responders and folks in Ottawa that pulled together um, in the face of this tragedy. The Premier stated that the provincial government, I quote, will provide whatever resources are required to support Ottawa as they work to recover. Can the minister uh, provide us with any more details on what res resources will be deployed to aid the ongoing relief efforts? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for the question. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, the work that uh, has been done by our first responders hydro workers, uh, City of Ottawa officials. I also want to commend uh, Premier Ford, uh, members of our cabinet, uh, Minister McLeod and Minister Fullerton, the uh, government members, the opposition members in Ottawa, the MPs, the city councillors for, for all of their work that they've, uh, they've done. Um, as uh, we announced uh, on Saturday, um, our government has uh, activated the disaster recovery assistance for Ontario. We, uh, we continue to work, for, work with uh, the City of Ottawa officials. Um, we continue to uh, have uh, people from my ministry on the ground being able to answer those questions for, uh, for citizens. And, uh, and again, I, I appreciate the, uh, the question from the Leader of the Opposition. This is something that we all need to, uh, to rally around. There was a tremendous devastation in those communities, and uh, those citizens of Ottawa are going to need the, uh, not just the financial supports, but uh, but also uh, the health care supports, the mental health supports. Uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, that our government uh, is willing to, uh, to put up to help uh, the city of Ottawa, and uh, I, I'd be pleased to uh, answer more in the supplement. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, on the weekend, the government did announce that it's activating the disaster recovery assistance uh, program in the Ottawa region to cover emergency expenses for residents over and above what private insurers can, re can provide. The Minister of Municipal Affairs has said that uh, the exact areas qualifying for assistance is in the process of being determined. Can the Minister assure the City of Ottawa and all Ottawa region residents who have experienced property damage or loss that they will be eligible for disaster recovery assistance? We know that this program has not been uh, as it should in the past in other situations that have occurred around our province, and we just want to get an assurance that, in fact, people who need the support are absolutely, absolutely going to get it. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thanks again uh, to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Typically. Uh, the DREO program, the two typical complaints that we received is that uh, uh, past governments haven't activated the program early enough and uh, claims uh, took too long to process. That's why our government acted quickly and, and enacted the program within uh, 24 hours of uh, the disaster taking place. And we've committed. We have people on the ground right now. Uh, in the city of Ottawa, we, we continue to pledge that uh, we're going to put as much resources uh, that we can to process those uh, those claims quickly. Uh, we we want to make sure that we're responsive to the needs of the citizens in Ottawa, and I think most uh, people know that uh, our, our assistance program is meant to supplement insurance, but that doesn't mean to say that people have to wait, and that, that's why we acted decisively and acted. Uh, uh, in the best interest of the people of Ottawa. Again, I, I want to reiterate my thanks to, to all members of this House uh, and the community of Ottawa. The one thing that uh, I know Premier Ford and I uh, saw when we toured the, uh, the areas of devastation was the tremendous sense of community, the fact that neighbours were working together to help each other to, uh, to get through this, and our government's going to stand with them. Thank you. Next question, a member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, as has already been noted, on Friday evening, tornadoes rampaged through the city of Ottawa, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. 
Thanks to the brave work of our first responders, we are blessed that no lives have been lost as a result of this. But the destruction and anguish left behind is all too real. In the communities of Dunrobin, Tren Darlington, and Craig Henry, many people have found themselves without a home. Thousands across Ottawa remain without power. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the House on the quick actions that our government has taken to provide support and relief to the people of Ottawa in this time of need? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, through you, Speaker, I, I want to thank the, uh, the member opposite for the question. I appreciated uh, seeing him yesterday uh, in, in Barhaven. And again, I want to uh, again acknowledge the tremendous work that's being done on the ground by our first responders, by our officials. I had an opportunity yesterday to uh, the Premier and I and, and, and uh, the, the MPPs on the ground to, uh, to, to meet with the mayor and, and with the chief and with other officials. Uh, they've been, uh, there's been incredible lines of communication uh, that have been, uh, been opened between uh, the group. And again, I want to credit all of those people uh, from all sides of the House and in the community for the work that they've done. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, the Premier toured uh, the Dunrobin uh, site with the Minister uh, Fullerton. Response. I had the opportunity to, to tour Trent Darling and Craig Henry uh, with uh, Minister McLeod. And again, I want to say that uh, we acted quickly with the disaster uh, recovery assistance uh, for Ontarians program. And in the supplemental, I'll give more details on that. Program. Thank you. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for that update and for his tireless work on behalf of the people of Ottawa to ensure that they received the support they needed. Yesterday, the Premier took the time to tour some of the damaged areas and visit with residents impacted by this disaster. As he said at the time, it was truly inspiring to see the strength and resilience of our people in this time of crisis. I am proud of both my hometown and of my colleagues in this chamber and at City Hall who have stepped up and showed such tremendous leadership. I know that many families right now are concerned about the financial impacts of this disaster. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update us on the rollout of the Ontario government's recovery assistance program? Minister. Uh, thanks again, Speaker. Thank you to uh, the member. Uh, my ministry staff are working with uh, Ottawa officials to identify the specific areas where the disaster recovery program will be activated. It's my expectation that those maps uh, will be available today. Uh, the program helps individuals and small businesses recover by providing financial assistance for essential costs not covered by insurance. Examples include basic uh, furnishings, appliances and emergency costs. And as I said earlier, the two biggest complaints was that uh, in past the, the program wasn't activated early enough and uh, that it takes long, a long, it used to take a long time to deal with these applications. Um, I've committed that my ministry will maintain a strict customer service standard to get those applications turned around as fast as possible. Uh, more information can be found on my department's website, ontario.ca disaster assistance. And for those who would like to help, I encourage you to call the Red Cross and the Salvation Army that are accepting donations. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since his election, many Ontarians have had serious doubts about the Premier's commitment to combating racism and prejudice. Then over the weekend, Faith Goldie. A far-right candidate for Toronto mayor with ties to neo-Nazi groups posted a picture on social media of the Premier posing for a picture with her and her supporters, to which she added, Faith Nation is for Nation. Will the Premier unequivocally denounce Faith Goldie and her hateful campaign and apologize to the Ontarians for appearing in a photo that is now being used as a de facto endorsement? Yeah. Boy, they've, they've sunk, Mr. Speaker, they've sunk to a new low. They've sunk to a new low that if they were at Ford Fest, it's the most diverse group anywhere in Canada, anywhere. 
of every race, of every creed, of every color, of every religion, and every political stripe. There's no group in the entire country that represents Toronto and Ontario more than Ford Nation does. And I, I can't help when thousands of people are coming at you and they're taking pictures right, left, and centre. Yep. You know something? They've hit a new low. Opposition They've hit a new order. low because I'll tell you what the people at Ford Fest talked about. Come to order. The people at Ford Fest talked about the $15 billion scandal, yep. the wasted taxpayers' money, how the NDP stood side by side Opposition with the Liberals as the scandal was unrolling year after year after year. That's what the people of Ford Fest were talking about. They weren't talking about anything else. They are disgusted by this financial scandal they face right now in the province of Ontario. How many NDP Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. <sighs> The Ford government is standing up and applauding. The Ford government is standing up and applauding for racism and prejudice. Shame on you. Groups like the Canadian Anti-Hate Network registered deep concern about Goldie at the outset of the Toronto campaign, saying they expect her to try to use her mayoral run as a platform to spread hate. They asked media and other candidates not to legitimize her campaign, and she's clearly used this photo with the Premier to claim exactly that sort of legitimacy. Sadly, we live in a time where hate groups pushing bigotry are seeking to divide people on the rise. What does the Premier say to Ontarians who may be wondering if the Premier's photo and the viral video of our Premier smiling and taking photo shots like a glamour model? Question. Will the Premier denounce that photo? Yes or no? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, what I found amazing yes, is the diverse group of people that showed up to Ford Fest. Yeah. The 8,000 people, and there were thousands of people that couldn't come in through the door. And again, I want, to remind, I want to remind the NDP and the Liberals what people Denver, were talking Paul, about. They were talking about the $15 billion scandal. They were talking about the wasted tax dollars we've Toronto, seen over 15 Paul, years. They want people held accountable. They want lower taxes, lower hydro bills, lower gas prices. They need good. Member for Toronto St. Paul's must come to order. Coming at me. Do you know why they've never experienced? Because they couldn't get a crowd like that. Any of them couldn't get a crowd like that. That is what Ontario's representative is, is the group of people that. The member for Saint, Toronto St. Paul's must come to order. The House will come to order. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glanville. for the Minister of Finance. And last week, we learned the ugly truth about the state the Liberals left this province in, thanks to the work of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry. Along with my colleagues, I was absolutely shocked and disappointed to learn the extent of the Liberals' waste and mismanagement over their 15 disastrous years in government. It is crucial that we end the Liberal culture of scandal after scandal and allow the public to once again have faith in its government. Here, here. Can the minister explain what further work is underway to restore accountability and trust in this province's Great finances? Question. Minister Finance. Uh, speaker, and to the member from uh, Flamborough-Glanbrook for, uh, for the question. The uh, Commission's report 
uh, Speaker, reveals the Liberals' culture of waste and mismanagement was embedded at the highest levels. The Liberals told us they balanced the budget in 2017-18 when they really ran a $3.7 billion deficit. Then, in the election year, they made empty promises for programs they could not afford. Instead of being honest about the cost of their out-of-control spending, the Liberals made up their own accounting rules to keep the true cost from the public. The Liberals secretly ran a $15 billion deficit, billions higher than anyone could total by using what the Auditor General called bogus, quote, bogus numbers. The Commission's report serves as an important first step in restoring accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. Speaker, our Fox. government is committed to respecting taxpayers and putting Ontario's fiscal house back in order. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker and Minister. It is an absolute relief to hear that further action is going to be taken based on the findings of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry. The multi-billion dollar hidden deficits, dishonest accounting tricks, and empty promises of the previous Liberal government simply cannot go I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. The previous Liberal government is simply betrayed the trust of the people of Ontario and here, must here. provide an explanation. Could the minister explain why it is so crucial to restore accountability and trust following this Liberal scandal? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Thanks to the Commission's diligent work, we now have a true accounting of Ontario's fiscal position. This was a necessary first step in restoring confidence in the government's books. While there's still much work to be done, we are already moving toward positive change. We are bringing greater transparency in preparing our financial documents, beginning with the 2017-18 public accounts. This has resulted in the Auditor General giving the province uh, public accounts a clean opinion, Speaker, for the first time in three years. Congratulations to Minister Beckman Falvey. It is now our duty to return to a balanced budget. We will do so on a timetable that is reasonable, modest, and pragmatic, Speaker. Together, Spons. we will return Ontario to balance and reclaim our position as the economic engine of Canada. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Here, through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Last week, the minister was scrambling to explain why Toronto should be reduced to 25 councillors serving 2.9 million citizens, while his riding of Leeds Grenville has a total of 96 councillors representing 70,000 citizens. Wow. wow. He couldn't explain the discrepancy, wow. but he did say that other municipal councils were under review. Can the minister tell us whether he'll be reducing the number of councillors serving his riding of Leeds Grenville from 96 to 1, and what other municipalities are under review? <laughs> minister. Well, I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question, and I, I, uh, I, I did talk about in that scrum the uh, review of uh, regional governance that we started. Uh, informally at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference, and that would uh, be more formalized in the fall. Uh, the member is right. There are uh, 13 municipalities in Leeds-Grenville, and the average council, si the average council size is uh, seven elected officials. Uh, my officials uh, in my riding are very efficient. In fact, I think they can give uh, the, uh, the council in Toronto a few lessons on how to run uh, an efficient and effective council meeting, and I'd be more than happy to uh, extend uh, further details in the supplementary. Supplementary. Speaker, this minister has reduced Toronto's local representation to one councillor for every 110,000 constituents, while his riding has a councillor for every 729. Oh, wow. Municipal oh. leaders across the province oh. saw what happened to the City of Toronto. The Premier ignored the elected representatives of that municipality, threw an election into chaos, and made it clear he'd take a chainsaw to the Charter of Rights to get his way. Mr. Speaker, the logic is flawed. The process is unfair and the numbers don't add up. Will the minister commit today 
to dealing respectfully with elected municipal governments to ensure that they get the final say on the size and design of their municipal councils. Good question. Minister. Speaker, again, through you to the member. Uh, there, here's a number that I want the, the member to, to hear, and that is zero. That's the amount of full-time councillors that are in Leeds Grenville. And I want him to listen to the, the other number again, zero. That's the amount of, of constituency staff that a part-time uh, councillor in a rural municipality has. These part-time councillors do an exceptional job. As the municipality of 15 hour council meeting you don't have the deadlock and dysfunction that we've seen at Toronto City Council that's exactly why we passed the better local government act the member can talk about part-time rural councillors all they want we placed this bill on the order paper and it's passed and we look forward to working for that with that Toronto Council on October 22nd the member for Don Valley East very much, Mr. Speaker. I also, on behalf of our caucus, would like to, uh, uh, to recognize uh, the devastation that took place in Ottawa and uh, thank everyone involved in the cleanup, especially our first responders. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, does the anti-racism directorate still exist? And if so, can you tell this House exactly what the next step you will be taking in order for it to reach its mandate? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can reassure the House here, I can reassure the people of Ontario that we denounce all forms of hate. All forms of hate. And we will not waver from de denouncing all forms of hate. What I'd like to ask the member, the member from Don Valley East, was what was he doing when his team was wasting $15 billion of the taxpayers' money. That's what I'd like to ask the member from Down Valley East, as they stood shoulder to shoulder along with the NDP and their whole gang over there, wasting billions and billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. I'd like to ask the member from Don Valley East how many backroom deals he was involved in. How many backroom deals was he involved in? We're going to find that out, how many deals you were involved in, along with— Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Hey. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a prediction that's pretty much going to be the same answer this Premier gives time after time for the next year. Yeah. You know, we see through that, Premier. My next question, my next question to the Premier— my next question to the Premier. Within the Anti-Racism Directorate, there was a commitment of $47 million uh, to support black youth uh, in Toronto, Hamilton, Windsor and Ottawa. Uh, I would like to know, Mr. Premier, uh, do you still intend to fund the $47 million to support the Black Youth Action Plan? Recently on the website, all the information has been taken down, and uh, people would like to know if you're still committed to supporting that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Community uh, Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. As we've always said and will continue to say, there is no place for racism in the province of Ontario. We are working, we are working diligently, and in fact, the PA uh, from Brampton South, who is uh, part of my team, is working actively on that particular issue, and we are working towards doing a government, a whole government approach review, as well as ensuring that the message is clear throughout the province of Ontario. We do not support any kind of racism, and we are working through all our ministries to work and ensure that opportunities are provided to all uh, marginalized groups, including the black communities, these Bonds. are things. These are things that are very important to our government. We will continue working on them and ensure that we provide the outcomes necessary for our uh, communities, for, for Ontario. 
Thank you. Next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. It was sobering to hear the minister's speech on Friday. It was shocking to hear the true state of the province's finances after 15 years of the Liberals and their mismanagement. Member for Don Valley East, come to order. The minister promised a dose of reality, and well, Speaker, he certainly delivered. Accounting tricks, empty promises. Member for Don Valley East, please come to order. Hidden deficits. The Liberals' skyrocketing debt and ballooning deficits should concern us all families, seniors, and particularly the next generation. I know it's deeply concerning to my constituents in Durham. Could the minister explain to this legislature the extent of the damage caused by 15 years of bad Liberal budgets? Minister Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Durham. The Liberals have less, uh, left us with the largest subnational debt on the planet. Ontario is $338 billion in debt. Speaker, even if we paid $1,000 million every year, it would take 338 years Shame. for Ontario to pay off the public Shame. debt left by the previous Liberal government. That's more than $24,000 for every single person in Ontario. The Auditor General said the Liberals made, quote, their own accounting rules that serve to obfuscate their financial directions. She said, that she said that serves to, quote, conceal the true annual deficit. Quote, it is imperative that we put an end to this reckless culture of waste, mismanagement, and scandals. We must work together, Speaker, to do everything we can to put Ontario back on secure financial footing. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's clear the action, that action must be taken to fix the mess the previous Liberal government has left behind. Absolutely. I'm proud that our government has taken the first steps in restoring accountability and trust in the province's finances. While we know the task ahead, Speaker, will not be easy, we are also well aware of the risks of further inaction. Could the minister please explain the danger of continuing down the path the previous Liberal government has set us on? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, simply put, the Liberals not only mortgaged the future of our children, but the future of our grandchildren and, believe it or not, their grandchildren as well. Again, the province is $338 billion in debt. In 2017-18, we paid $11.9 billion in interest payments alone to service that debt. That's more than the operating budget of the City of Toronto, more than a fifth of our health care budget, almost half of our education budget, and nearly a billion dollars more than we spend on post-secondary education and training. Balancing the budget, Speaker, is not only a fiscal imperative, it is a moral imperative. We owe it to our children, our grandchildren Spots. and their grandchildren to ensure that vital services and good-paying jobs will be for them, Speaker, down the road. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Finance. Last week, the Minister of Infrastructure was asked a very straightforward question in this House. Has the government cancelled the $100 million grant program for rural natural gas expansion? The minister didn't give a straight answer. And that same afternoon, the Minister of Infrastructure cancelled $8.9 million in grant funding for a natural gas expansion program in North Bay. So, Speaker, the answer was yes, they were cutting the grant program. Can the minister tell us why the government cut this long-promised $100 million program to expand natural gas into rural Ontario? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Speaker, to highlight the fact that we're saving the taxpayers $100 million while expanding natural gas service 
to more consumers across Ontario. This is simply swapping taxpayer funding for private sector in investment. It's quite something, actually, to, to uh, hear the member attacking this when CBC reported last week that her own leader was, quote, in agreement with Ford about natural gas expansion. Are they still on speaking terms, Speaker? You know, when you, we've seen this time and time again from the NDP over the years. They tell one group one thing and tell another group of people the complete op opposite, Speaker. The negativity expressed by member by this member and other critics are putting the project in North Bay in jeopardy. Her comments are completely irresponsible. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Minister of Finance. Interesting about doing one thing and saying another because, Speaker, it is unbelievable that this Conservative government would start the day by announcing a program to expand natural gas into rural Ontario and then spend the day cancelling $100 million in funding to expand natural gas into rural Ontario. So, this funding cut has unexpectedly and suddenly halted a natural gas expansion project in North Bay. So, Speaker, through you to the, to the minister, did the Minister of Finance actually approve this funding cut to the people in his own riding? <laughs> minister, of minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the members that offered uh, for the question. Mr. Speaker, we campaigned in the last election to open Ontario up for business and to lower energy bills for the people of this province. Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, opposite party uh, supports only 12 individual projects uh, across this province for a cost of $100 million. What our plan is going to do, Mr. Speaker, is add 80 new communities, 80 communities uh, in Ontario will have access uh, to natural gas. Mr. Speaker, that's nearly 35,000 more individuals, more households that are going to have access uh, to natural gas. And Mr. Speaker, what this does, this saves those households up to $2,500 uh, per year. And Mr. Speaker, this is on top of scrapping the carbon tax here in Ontario that's going to save an additional uh, $80 per year for those families. Now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Kitchener Conestoga. The question is for the Minister of Finance. We ran on a commitment to the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in the province's finances. After 15 years of liberal waste and mismanagement and scandal, the people of Ontario spoke loud and clear. They had enough. The people decided it was time for a government that was, would respect them and respect their hard-earned tax dollars, and for good reason. Last Friday, the minister showed us all just how damaging the Liberal government's failed fiscal policies have been to our province. Could the minister please explain the shocking findings of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry? Mr. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. Uh, I agree, uh, Speaker, we must take immediate action to restore accountability and trust in government. That's why this morning, Premier Ford announced our government's intention to form a select committee on financial transparency. Should the motion pass, Speaker, the committee will use the findings of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry to determine how the Liberals' disastrous poli policies ever saw the light of day. The scandal laid out in the pages of the Commissioner's report is unprecedented in recent Canadian history. The Liberal Party's accountability for this scandal did not end on Election Day, Speaker. Their accountability started that day, the day Premier Ford took office. People deserve answers, and we will ensure that the people of Ontario get those answers. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. It is disappointing to see the depths of the previous Liberal government's waste and mismanagement. It was no wonder that the people of Ontario voted for a government that is committed to restoring accountability and trust that was absent for so long. 
Our government has been making positive change for people right across, province, right across the province since day one. However, the minister's speech last week illustrated the challenging road that lays before us. Could the minister please inform the House of our government's next steps in fixing the mess the Liberals left for Great us? Great Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker. I would encourage everyone here to take a look at the Auditor General's pre-election report on Ontario's finances. In it, she said, and I quote, the government is making up its own accounting rules, quote. She used words like, quote, conceal, bogus, deceptive, and unreliable, quote, to describe liberal documents tabled, tabled in this legislature. This is not a normal situation we're seeing, Speaker. I'll say this again. What we are witnessing is without precedent in Canadian politics. When taken together, the conclusions of the Auditor General and the Commission of Inquiry are a scathing indictment of how the Liberals broke the public's trust. This is not only about the number, Speaker, it's about transparency and trust. The situation cannot be allowed to fester any longer. Lots. We will restore accountability and trust in government. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. People in the basic income pilot had made long-term plans. They signed leases, enrolled in school, based on a promise that the program would last three years. Promise made, promise Their broken. hopes for the future are now replaced with feelings of deep betrayal. Stress and anxiety has returned. International researchers were watching, and now they are calling out the government. They said, and I quote, not only is the cancellation inconsistent with international best practices, but it violates your own Canadian policy for the ethical conduct of experiments involving humans, end of quote. Why is this minister continuing to stick with their cruel and unethical decision to cancel the basic income pilot? Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I reject the premise of the question. Uh, this government is allowed to make decisions on uh, financial matters and it's allowed to make and set policy direction. Um, this matter is before the courts, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on specifics. But what I can tell you, and what I said in July and what I said in August, that there will be a compassionate runway, which is happening. No one has lost their checks as of this month, and that member opposite knows full well. And if she would like to listen to the response, I'll provide her with the action plan of this government. We hit the pause on an unsustainable program and an unsustainable uh, plan that the previous Liberal administration brought forward, which was disjointed and which was patchwork and which wasn't lifting the one in seven people in the province of Ontario out of poverty. So what we did is we hit the pause button across the board, allowed Lots. for a 1.5 percent increase in social assistance rates right across Ontario, and we've come forward with a 100-day plan, and we're going to see more people out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Remind the government that on the campaign trail, the Premier said that he would not cancel this program, and yet here he is cancelling the program. Promise made, promise broken. And adding insult to injury, the people whose lives were ripped apart have never received any communication from the ministry. No letters, no emails, no phone calls. All they have to go on are media reports. The disrespect shown by this government is absolutely reprehensible. They had just whipped, ripped away the hopes, dreams and income of the basic income participants, but they didn't have the common decency to speak to them. Speaker, when will this government show just a little respect for Ontarians? Some real compassion. Minister. Thanks, Speaker. We have been very clear. We are going to be very compassionate government. We are going to make sure that the one in seven people living in poverty in this province are set up for success. That means for when Hamilton someone Mountain is employable, we are going to put the supports in place to get them back into the workforce. Where they're not employable, we're going to make sure they have the for supports in place come to, order. to make their life a lot easier. But what wasn't happening under the previous Liberal administration, aided and abetted by that 
official opposition for 97 percent of the time was a patchwork system that didn't lift people up. There was no social safety net. So let me say this. The best social safety net is a compassionate society. The best social circumstances are when those people who can work are working, and the best social program in the province of Ontario is a job. Stop the clock. For children, community and social services come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The minister will come to order. The minister will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. I'm going to warn the member for Hamilton Mountain. Let's stop now. Let's stop now. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Last week, our government took action to deliver on our promise to repeal the Green Energy Act. After 15 years of bad decisions by the Liberals and being enabled by the NDP, Mr. Speaker, we find this province's hydro system in the mess it is in today. The Green Energy Act was a crucial part of those bad decisions, and I know repealing it is an important step for our government. Can the minister please tell the members of this House and all Ontarians why it is so important to repeal the Green Energy Act? Minister of Energy. I want to thank the uh, member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound and as well for the question and as well, Mr. Speaker, for the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex, our Minister of Infrastructure, the champion of fighting against this horrible act, the Green Energy Act. More than seven years of his commitment has finally paid off. Let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. The only thing green about the Green Energy Act is the green that lined the pockets of Liberal insiders, Mr. Speaker. The Green Energy Act also represents the largest transfer of money from the poor and middle class to the rich in Ontario's history. It's a symbol of a, it's a, symbol of a failed energy policy of the past with no regards to the people who actually pay hydro boat bills month in and month out. The Act forced waste Useful projects and unwilling communities and drove up the costs of hydro bills for families and businesses across this province. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to deliver on our promises for the people. We're committed to lowering hydro bills by 12 per cent. Getting rid of the Green Energy Act is Pons. an important step towards that. A promise made, Mr. Speaker, a promise kept. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. I'd like to thank the Minister of Energy for his leadership on this important step in the right direction. Lowering hydro costs for the people of Ontario is one of our government's most important promises and priorities. I'm happy to know that our government is making good on that promise, Mr. Speaker. And I know the minister is from northern the community of Kenora and Rainy River, and I want to join with, the, with all of his constituents there in wishing him a happy birthday today. Oh, happy birthday! And I know that he understands the impact to rural communities like mine and Bruce Gray on Sound and all of the great ridings around this province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the members of this House and all Ontarians how repealing the Green Energy Act is going to help rural communities? Here. Here. Mr. I want to I want, to, I want to thank the member for his question, and it's true, I'm now old enough to reflect back on a province that had an energy advantage. Manufacturers here in southern Ontario, forestry mills and mines firing on all cylinders because Ontario had a responsible energy plan. That changed 15 years ago, and the Green Energy Act had a lot to do with that. Mr. Speaker, this, repealing this act is about giving power back to the municipalities and back to the people of Ontario. Our government is making sure that communities in rural Ontario aren't forced to become home to wasteful energy projects in the future. I take this quote from Rex Murphy, one of the most respected political commentators in Canada, who stated, Ontario's Green Energy Act was a horror for business, a gross invasion of municipal authority, and sent successive auditor generals to whatever is the chartered accountant's version Bonds? of a hospice centre. Mr. Speaker, less eloquently, a Liberal elite got rich, Liberal Party coffers were filled, and the pocket. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock.
Start the clock. Next question. The member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long -term care. We have a crisis in our hospital system. Hallway medicine and overcrowding has become the norm. In Sudbury, Health Sciences North faces an $11 million deficit. So far, 60.5 nursing positions have been lost as they try to balance their budget. Now, they have announced that they will be closing part of their breast cancer clinic, leading to more stress and longer wait time for women facing breast cancer. Will the Minister of Health commit today to providing Health Sciences North with the funding necessary to end the layoffs and keep the full breast cancer clinic open in Sudbury? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I thank the member very much for the question. In fact, the situation at Health Sciences North is uh, financially very difficult with an $11 million deficit. However, $4.8 million has already been granted to them to try and alleviate some of the situation. But I know that the Lynn is working very closely with Health Sciences North to try and alleviate the situation. The nursing positions that are um, leaving are being dealt with through attrition and retirements, as the member will know. Um, I know that more work has to be done, and uh, I have regular reports from the Lynn on that, and I know the ministry is doing whatever they can to try and alleviate the situation as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, earlier this month, the minister said that our hospital will, find, will have to find innovative and efficient ways to operate. Like Health Sciences North, most Ontario hospitals are all, already struggling with chronic underfunding. Is the minister's definition of efficiency just a code for austerity, flatline, zero increase budget, like the Liberal did for the past eight years? Let me be clear, Speaker. The efficiencies have already been found and implemented in our hospital, and now they have to decide which programs are they going to cancel. In Sudbury, it's the breast screening clinic. Will the minister ensure that women with cancer receive timely care and fund health sciences not appropriately? Response, Minister. The health care situation for the people around the area of Health Sciences North, of course, is our top priority. We don't want anyone to lose services, but while I recognize that most hospitals have done some work to find these efficiencies, there is still a lot more work to do. We also know that many hospitals in Ontario right now are operating at over 100 per cent capacity, that there are beds in places that should not be, there should not be beds. Uh, we are trying to alleviate that situation situation by, first of all, um, building more long-term care beds because up to 25 per cent of all patients in any hospital across Ontario right now are being filled by people who should be elsewhere. They don't need to be in hospital, but they're there because they can't get to a long-term care bed or they can't get to home care because they don't have the supports that they need. We're also working response. on alleviating the response and the issues related to people with chronic mental health problems, many of whom circle in and out of hospitals. We need to deal with that. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I was delighted to see that the minister was able to attend the Ontario Coaching Excellence Awards this weekend in Toronto, and I was also happy to see that Megan Wilson, a rugby coach from my riding of Brantford Brant, was honoured with the Grassroots Coach of the Year Award. Ms. Wilson was honoured for her work on a free rugby camp on the Six Nations of the Grand River where youth aged 5 to 12 could participate. The Iroquois Roots Rugby Program she started in 2017 allows Indigenous youth to participate in rugby programs free of charge. Megan is also a full-time student, a varsity rugby player at McMaster University, and tireless volunteer that makes our communities better off. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Megan for her contributions to my community and ask the minister, can she tell us more about the Ontario Coaching Excellence Awards? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. 
Thank you. You are rightfully proud of Megan. She is doing an excellent job in, uh, in Brantford. So thank you for your question. I also want to congratulate Megan Wilson, but she was one of nine coaches who were honoured for their hard work and dedication this weekend. If I may, Speaker, I would like to congratulate Don Manarkowski of Oshawa, Ian Atkinson of Waterloo, Giuseppe Politi of Sudbury, Glenn Pauley of Waterloo, Ryan Jones of Scarborough, Brenda Willis of Kingston, Ian Rupnaran from Brampton, Jay McNeely from North York, and Kathy Boys from St. Catharines. It was an honour this weekend to uh, acknowledge the excellent work that the great coaches are doing across our communities, kicking off the fourth annual Na National Coaches Week by Fonts. participating in the Ontario Coaching Excellence Award. We are celebrating the people behind the teams that we see on the ice, in the water, in our courts and on our fields. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the superb. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, for that answer. I am so pleased to see that our government for the people recognizes the importance of sport in our communities and how much coaches do better to do better for our athletes and communities as a whole. I think I can speak for members from all sides of the House when I say that coaches give us so much to our local athletes and that we should be taking steps to make sure we recognize their great work. Can the minister please provide the House with more details concerning the Ontario Coaching Excellence Awards and National Coaches Week? Minister. Happy to. The Ontario Coaching Excellence Award is a kickoff off event for the National Coaches Week here in Ontario and across Canada. The award honours 10 coaches from all across Ontario who've made a difference coaching aspiring athletes. These coaches work with athletes ranging from grassroots level, like Megan, um, to those performing on the Olympic stage. September 26th, 22nd through to the 30th marks the fourth annual National Coaches Week, the 13th Coaches Week in Ontario, to celebrate the tremendous impact coaches have on athletes in our communities. The Coaches Association of Ontario has also partnered with four communities from across the province to deliver community clinics which recruit, develop, educate and celebrate community volunteer coaches. I call on all members to thank their coaches and their riding for Spons. the wonderful work they are doing. Thank you. Question, the member for Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. <laughs> it was great to spend some extra time at the IPM last week and great to see my fellow colleagues there as well. But the word on the back roads and at the streets of the IPM is that Foodland Ontario is on the chopping block by the Ford government. Uh -oh. The goal of this program is to encourage people to eat Ontario-grown food, and we all know the slogan, good things grow in Ontario. Coined in 1977, by the way, this program helps farmers, processors, and consumers. And you know what, Speaker? It creates jobs. Good jobs in rural Ontario. My question to the minister is, can he ensure the farmers and processors of Ontario that this program will not be cut in any way, shape or form? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member across from asking this great question. I want to say that Foodland Ontario is one of the best programs for the horticulture sector in the province of Ontario that they've ever had in order to encourage people to buy our local product, the best food made and uh, grown in the world right here in Ontario, and the people are going to the stores buying it because it was produced in Ontario. I can assure you that his ears must either be not hearing anything or hearing things that are not said because obviously there's been no discussion from my ministry that says we're going to do anything but improve and make sure Poonland Ontario works for the people of Ontario. That concludes the time we have available for question period this morning. I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Gates assumes ballot item number 32 and Mr. Rakasevic assumes ballot item number 45. 
I wish to inform the House that we have a former member visiting us today in the Legislature. The member for Burlington in the 41st Provincial Parliament, Eleanor McMahon, has joined us this morning. Welcome. And the member for Ottawa South informed me that he wishes to raise a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be quick. I just wanted to add to what the member from Nepean Carlton said. Ottawa South, too, was affected by the storm. There's some very small pockets in Hunt Club and Greenboro and South Keys where there's been some very serious damage. People have lost uh, their, uh, some, their contents of their house, their roofs. And I want to thank the minister for uh, I had a good chat with him. But I also want to thank all the residents uh, who over the weekend were helping each other. It was really quite incredible. People were checking on neighbours, seniors, people with babies. And uh, one man said to me, Brian said, you know, I didn't know it would take uh, a storm like this for me to get to meet all my neighbours. And I would like to say one more thanks to the Ottawa Hydro crews who spent about two days on uh, Ottawa's Ottawa Hydro uh, crews who spent, uh, thank you for correcting me, Ottawa Hydro, uh, Ottawa Hydro, uh, Ottawa Hydro crews who um, fixed Albion Road. They were there for about two days. And uh, it's dangerous work, and uh, we all owe them a debt of gratitude. There being no deferred vote, this House is in recess until 1 p.m.